Hello everyone! I haven't been able to develop newer games for these past couple of months because of the holiday I took with my family in January, which was very enjoyable. I really enjoyed connecting with my family, but also because COVID ended infecting us all and ultimately it took my father from us this February. So I'm dedicating this video to his memory, if you'll excuse the sad news before the lecture. And speaking of which, since I just gave a Neurogames lecture this week, I thought it would be relevant for me to post it in my channel. Think of it as an update and remix of my talk Neurogames are Nigh, a state of affairs I presented at Technically Games Australia in 2020. So without further ado, let's start by defining the keyword. Neurogame. For the purposes of this presentation, a neurogame is defined as a digital game that interfaces directly with the nervous system as a form of game mechanic. Whether it reads your brain waves as a form of input or whether it stimulates your brain as a form of feedback. It is important to acknowledge that this working definition is not an industry standard. Indeed, if you search the word online, you'll find that it has been used as a buzzword, tagline, or aspirational goal. Many designers speak of mind games to define games that appeal to more intellectual sensitivities or that explicitly exercise cognitive skills. As a pioneer myself in neurogame design, I intend to popularize the use of the term neurogame as a game whose core mechanics depend on interfacing with neurons. So to begin this lecture, I'm going to briefly show you what expectations media has given us about neurogames as a concept. That way we can go on into what is a little bit more important for us, which is the history of neurogames from a technical perspective. What kinds of technologies are available this century to be able to play with your nervous system as a form of game mechanic? And then I will give you my opinion on what the future of neurogames could be like in the next two to three years. So as I said, first let's see what kinds of stories inspire us to interface with the nervous system purely as a form of entertainment. This is important. Whereas the Matrix may seem like an obvious candidate, you must remember that the story of the Matrix talks about a prison of the senses, which was not initially designed for entertainment, even though they do use entertainment as a form of imprisoning people's minds. Entertainment ethically requires the audience to have the agency to consume the product at will, or indeed, to stop doing so at any point they so decide without meaningful repercussions. Otherwise, the illusions being consumed may fall into the category of deception at best, torture at worst. So let's start with a gray area here. Recall with a K from Total Recall, the movie from 1990, is presented as a form of entertainment where the user may escape into a predetermined fantasy, which is indistinguishable from reality. The selling point here is that the user doesn't need to travel to their dream destination, but rather, the user may vividly dream about their destination. Whereas the main character in the movie was a real spy deceived by a ruse, or a client who seamlessly enjoyed the service is a matter of film analysis, which I will leave to the film experts. Game Pods from Existence, the movie from 1999, are presented as a biological console, depicted here, which loads fantasies directly into users' spinal cords. The availability and ubiquity of this technology led a faction of characters in the film to be concerned about the people's perception of reality being distorted, which if you take into account the last slide, may not be too far-fetched a thought. Coming closer to this day and age, here we can see the Animus Omega from Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, a game from 2013. Here the Animus Omega is presented as a consumer-grade Animus that allows users to play games based on the main character's exploration of their ancestors' memories. Basically, Abstergo Entertainment is monetizing their research on genetic memories using brain-computer interfaces. From the same year, the Nerve Gear depicted here from Sword Art Online is presented as a commercially available device 
that allows users to play a massive multiplayer online role-playing game known as an MMORPG. Later developments in the anime explore a series of ethical and moral dilemmas as users become hostages of sentient artificial intelligences. And even closer to our day and age, here we can see a brain dance concept art for the game Cyberpunk 2077, a game that was prematurely released in 2019. Here, the brain dance is a device that records users' memories, which can later be edited and sold to the general public for personal entertainment. The game explores the repercussions of a black market, which caters to users, which demand experiences that transgress legal, ethical, and moral boundaries. And I'm pretty certain that you must know many more examples where brain-computer interfaces are used for entertainment and pleasure in fiction. So let me know in the commentaries if you can think of any other examples that are particularly influential to this topic. Now, let's see what technological developments have led to making neurogames a reality from all these fantasies that have inspired us. Let's first try to frame our study into this century's developments, shall we? So we start with Mindball, a museum exhibition from 2002 by product line IPAB. Mindball is one of the first ludic applications of electroencephalographic technologies known as EEG. EEG basically detects your brain waves, your brain activity. Here we can see two players using EEG devices to push a ball by relaxing. The player who relaxes the most moves the ball the easiest. Mindflex, a game from 2009 sold by Mattel, is one of the successors of Mindball. Some critics here believe that the ball in the game moves at random intervals and does not really use EEG signals, although the device uses the same chip as the nearest sky devices, which are accessible, reliable, and successfully used in both laboratory and ludic settings. Oh, speaking of which, Mindlight, a video game from 2014, uses the NeuroSky device to capture EEG signals as a game mechanic for therapeutic purposes. The more the child relaxes, the brighter the light shines in the game, training children to use coping mechanisms for their anxiety disorders. The NeuroSky is but one of many consumer-grade EEG devices, not all of which are game developer-friendly, mind you. Most manufacturers assume scientists and engineers will be making use of their devices, which means their SDKs are not always immediately compatible with game engines. So plug and play is still but a fantasy I'm trying to make a reality. Now let's get deeper into interacting with the brain. BrainNet, as you can see here, is an application from 2014 by Dr. Rao, Dr. Stoko et al. at their laboratory in the University of Washington. They aim to create a rudimentary form of telepathy called brain-to-brain -brain communication. They use non-invasive systems to interface with the brain using transcranial magnetic stimulation, abbreviated TMS. It is basically a couple of magnetic coils changing polarity really fast to excite or inhibit an area of the brain. In this example, one player is looking at the game but has no controller, that is Dr. Rao as player one, whereas a second player in another building cannot see the game but has a controller, that's player two, Dr. Stucco for you. When player one has an intention to fire a rocket, an impulse is sent to player's two motor cortex to make his wrist twitch and press the rocket launching button. So as you can see, they're using brain-to-brain -brain communication to split the visual and the motor parts of a game, just as a proof of concept. Here we can see a single-player TMS game from 2016 from the same laboratory at the University of Washington. They are following a similar principle as before. The single player here cannot see the screen, but their visual cortex is stimulated with TMS to create a phosphine a sort of flash of light. When the player sees the phosphine, they know they have to press a button to go down a ladder in the maze. Otherwise, if they don't see the phosphine, they have to press the button to move forwards. It's rudimentary, yes, but it shows the basic game mechanics that could be applied using neuromodulating devices. And speaking of neuromodulation, 
Here we can see an experiment at the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA, which proved that transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, can enhance learning of virtual piloting exercises. Basically, they send a the current through the prefrontal cortex to enhance concentration. Gamers have tried replicating the same benefits to very little success using commercially available TDCS devices, known as FOCUS, without dot in between the C and the U. The general consensus is that the failures of the gamers are due to the lack of a team of scientists placing and regulating the impulses in the correct place. On top of that, TDCS can potentially irritate facial muscles and even burn skin if the conditions are not closely monitored. Focus, of course, is a commercially available device and has lots of fail-safes. Now, let's look at Control Labs' own experiment from 2018. Here, Control Labs, in partnership with Facebook Reality Labs, developed a neural interface technology that catches nervous impulses arriving into the wrist or forearm to decode the way in which the fingers are supposed to be moving in the hand. Here, we no longer need cameras to guess where those fallacies are. As of my last communication with Facebook Reality Labs, however, the project has been put on hold for the past year, so I'm still trying to convince them to lend me a device for game development purposes. So if you know anyone in Facebook Reality Labs, tell them I would gladly make a neuro game with their device if they let me. Now, as of last year, we can see Neuralink surprising us by showcasing a game of mind pong being played by a macaque who was trained to play with a joystick and rewarded with fruit juice. Later, they disconnected the joystick to prove the macaque was playing only with its mind. As you've seen in previous experiments with new technologies in these slides, the game is rudimentary and not meant to prove the viability of neuro games as an entertaining medium, but rather the viability of the interfaces being developed. The Neuralink's target audience is the medical community and users with limited mobility. Even if Elon Musk keeps assuring interviewers that the technology may be used for entertainment purposes in the future, quote unquote, which is business speak for maybe 50 to 100 years, who knows? All right, so speaking of the future, if we go back to what inspired neuro games in the first chapter of this presentation, we can deduce what fantastical new applications could be possible for neuro games. That is the easy part. In the interest of practicality, I will talk about what you can really expect to happen with neuro games in the next two to three years. Emotive is about to launch their new EEG model to the consumer market. This is called the MN8, here depicted. It is difficult to immediately notice in this picture, but the device consists of two wireless earbuds, which have one EEG sensor each. They have been using the M8 to research work productivity and driver's concentration. As the technology becomes available to the public, it may be one of the lightest EEG devices that could be easily used for casual gaming. However, Emotive's low concern for accessibility make their models very developer-unfriendly. On the other side of the fence, there is OpenBCI, who is developing the Galia Rig, a brain-computer interface designed for gaming, which will have a plethora of sensors including electroencephalography (EEG). Electrooculography (EOG), electromyography (EMG), electrodermal activity (EDA), and photoplethysmography (PPG). These sensors are intended to measure data from the brain, eyes, heart, skin, and muscles. This setup is intended for more hardcore gamers and designers who want to exploit biosensors for more precision measuring emotions and facial expressions. The design philosophy is to take gaming to the next level. One may hope that Galea's integration with game engines would no longer require a computer engineering degree as with other devices in the market. You can also expect more theoretical developments in the area of neuro game design. My last video talks about using Nathan Semertsidi's brain computer integration framework as a game design tool. Click on the link and you can watch it at your leisure. 
I actually would recommend you to try your hand at the workshop itself and make a neuro game sketch of your own. Another thing that may happen is that we start developing more policies and laws to protect neuro gamers from abuse. More on that next time when I talk about neuro rights applied to neuro games. Thank you very much for paying attention to this presentation. I hope it was interesting to you and I'll be seeing you next time.